second. We started with about 170 nominations for 70 different professors, and then the student senate took it. We narrowed that down to the uh, average amount, and the students took that again, and we got over 700 votes for Professor Villa, and Dr. Jacob was our winner. And some of my favorite about him was Dr. Jacob is an extraordinary professor. Not only does he teach a wide variety of challenging biology classes, but he also oversees many different research projects conducted by his students. Another student said, Dr. Jaco takes time out of his busy day to help his students make his classes better understand the new material, as well as to help his new research students with their progress. Dr. Jaco does not give students answers. Instead, he provides students with many opportunities to test hypotheses, solve our own problems, and learn in greater depth. He provides all the resources he can in order to help students succeed. He gets to school early and stays very late, and during that time, he is doing everything he can to help his students and to increase their research learning. Dr. Jacob goes above and beyond his responsibilities as a professor and truly deserves the Professor of the Year Award. And my favorite was, he's just that awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so without any further ado, here is Dr. Will Jacob with his Back to, class, back to College class. All right, so my goal today is to talk about this. And it's, and it's, um, it's a little bit of what I think, what I know, and what I think I know um, about the way animals that are typically largely unseen by most of us because they're small, um, what they need to do to acquire the food that they, that they utilize. Um, the can of soup is intentional um, because that's my model of the, the way of the oceans. Okay, so this is our typical sort of concept of a food web. Big things eat little things, eat smaller things, and then there's finally some small, smallest of all particles. Um, it's what I learned, I suppose, at one time, and you can still find something that looks like that where you have some, the smallest of all particles are unicellular single-celled plants. They're consumed by small animals. We'll call them zooplankton. Then there's some, some s developmental stages of fish. I have a little, I forgot one of these things. Developmental stages of fish. Ah. And then those are eaten by small fish, and they're eaten by bigger fish. So big things eat little things. But everything is viewed from the standpoint of a particle, and typically it's a particle that we can see. This is probably a better representation um, is there a way to adjust the lights a little bit? Can we, well, I'm sure there is. <laughs> Can we turn them down just a whisper? Everybody close your eyes a little bit, then it'll cut, squint a little bit, and it'll help. Okay. Well, pretend the lights are low. Um, the reality of it is that things are probably a little more complex. And, and our concept of, of using or only evaluating particles that we see is probably is naive. Um, we're going to talk about the fact that there is organic carbon in both freshwater and marine system that exists in a dissolved form. There's a variety of small unicellular bacteria. There are, what's left? Oh, there's detritus, organic material that's degraded. There's, it's far more complex than the concept of one fish eats another fish eats a smaller fish and finally eats something else. Oh, hi. <laughs> okay. Wow. Whoa. All right. This represents sort of a recent sort of distribution of sizes of materials that are available as food. Oh, bless you. Great. <sighs> now you can fall asleep and no one will know. Um, when we talk about things like zooplankton, we're talking about animals that are greater than a millimeter to give us a frame or frame of reference to something on the order of oh, 10 or 0 0.1, 0 0.01 millimeters, 10 microns. Phytoplankton are smaller still, but we're talking about, so if this represents a millimeter, sort of 0.1 millimeters down to about 0 0.001 millimeters. Bacteria are smaller still. We can talk about, if you will, microns from two micrometers in diameter to below one micron. 
And then we enter the world of things that are kind of dissolved. So they, we think of them as dissolved organic materials. But in reality, they're just particles that are too far, too small for us to see. So we can talk about viruses. Um, we can talk about assemblages of macromolecules or big molecules like proteins or polysaccharides that are aggregates. And then finally, way down here, we run into really literally organic material that is in solution. So we run, we run, we span the gamut from really large sort of animal plankton through plant plankton or animals that are living freely in the ocean through bacteria, viruses, and then finally to macromolecules. So there's a, actually animals that live in the sea or in freshwater, doesn't really matter. Um, are exposed to a variety of different kinds of organic materials which could represent a source of nutrition. And so when we look at sort of, uh, I guess, again, a more recent distribute or explanation or description of how materials are flowing in, our, in marine systems, we can talk about, if you will, particulate organic material. We can talk about dissolved organic material. And when we talk about particles, typically it's things we're referring to entities that can be visualized easily. And I guess it doesn't mean all particles. It just means the particles that we can easily see. And that's really sort of what I've been trying to play with for a while now, I guess, is to sort of ask questions about what's in Campbell's soup, if you will, if Campbell's soup represents the ocean or a freshwater system and then how animals can exploit them. So I'm going to sort of view the world as we can talk about sort of a, what is it, a consume, is this what it would be? A, a particle free versus sort of chunky. So it's, so if we talk about chunky soup, if you will, we're talking about algae, unicellular plant cells which can be consumed by my little invertebrate animals. Yes, sir. I would be delighted to. That would be great. Super. OK. Let's go through the list, and then we'll invert it for us. Algae, unicellular plants, greater than 2 microns, 2.002 millimeters. Bacteria, 1 to 2 microns. Let's talk about things that are tiny particles. I'm intentionally vague, because there are many different kinds of tiny particles. And finally, we get to those things that are truly dissolved. Good question. So how much organic carbon exists in dissolved form versus particulate form? What's your guess? Which, how many say more dissolved? All the smart people. OK, because that's what it is. There's a, depending upon who you read, there's 10 times more organic material in solution as, quote, dissolved than exists and is available to animals as particles. So particles, our mindset about how animals feed is driven by cap the capture of particles. But in actuality, there's more organic carbon that exists in something that we would consider to be dissolved. A second question would be how much of that organic material is actually available to animals. And that's a question that actually hasn't been completely resolved yet. But there's no question there's more organic material in either as the dissolved form or in very, very small particles than exist as particles that we recognize. So I want to talk about feeding biology, how animals collect food. And so what we're going to really focus on is this group of animal, or this kind of animal, which is a rotifer. And rotifers are small. The biggest one is about a millimeter in size. Planktonic, most of them, they swim. Um, they have an anterior end that feeds. Most of them, but not all, have a back end where materials leave. Um, and most of them, many of them reproduce without a partner. They, they reproduce parthenogenically. They can make babies without the presence of a member of the other sex. And that's actually going to come in, that's important later on. So we're going to talk about rotifers and use that as a model to think about how all organisms or all how small, how all invertebrate animals might exploit these different kinds of resources. Think. Why study rotifers? It's obvious. They're pretty. Well, that's, that's true. Um, 
they're pretty animals, so, and they're, there's a great diversity of both size. They range from animal from organisms that are very, very small, roughly 50 micrometers in size, or point, I think it's 0.05 millimeters, to animals that are much larger, about a millimeter. Most of them are free swimming. Not all of them are. Some of them are incapable of swimming. They're actually important members or elements of aquatic ecosystems. Most, they're actually more important in freshwater systems than they are in marine systems. But in estuaries, this areas where fresh, the marine environment and the freshwater environment meet, they're actually important as predators, potentially. And they're also serve as prey. So they actually are, have, uh, they're important elements of aquatic ecosystems. From a more practical standpoint, there is no animal that has perhaps had a greater contribution to the rearing or the commercial rearing of fishes and, and shrimps and those kinds of animals than a rotifer. They are a significant food source for developmental stages of fish. And so there's actually a fair amount of interest in the conditions which promote rotifer growth and reproduction. And actually, the one thing I didn't tell you is it's really hard to kill them, um, which is a good thing when, when we work with students. Um, <laughs> it's true, OK? It's just an inevitability. Just, just to give you an idea of sort of diversity, this is an animal that builds a tube. It lives in a tube. It makes it cobbles together these little bricks that it assembles to create that tube out of its own poops, no less, um, which is pretty creative. Um, this is an animal that forms a swimming colony. It's so if you think about the jacks that we might have played with as a kid, this is a jack, if that's the right word, that tumbles through the water. Each of these individuals has a ring of locomotory structures. We're going to call them cilia. And so this entire colony, which is they're all genetically identical because they're all clones of one another, tumbles through the water. It's very nice. The, the, both of these actually are found locally in our ponds and rivers, streams. All right. All right. Now it now becomes a little, oh, no, don't do that. Oh, well, I did. All right. Um, this is a drawing of sort of our generic rotifer. Oh, I do need this thing. And where are you? There you are. This is the sort of, if you will, the head end. And so there's a, what I want to sort of point out to you is that there are two sort of bands of these beading structures that we, we know to be cilia. There is something called the trochus, which is the name's kind of irrelevant, but there's a, a more anterior one. And there's one below it that's called the cingulum. Okay. And these two bands of cilia beat in opposition to one another. Or let me rephrase that. If you believe the story, these two bands of cilia beat in opposition to one. Well, actually, that is true. They do beat in opposition to one another. The, this anterior one, which we've called the trochal disc or the trochus, beats posteriorly. And the posterior one, which we've called the cingulum up here, beats anteriorly. So they beat you know, towards each other. And the idea or the description about how this animal captures particles is that it's actually collecting particles within, if you will, the groove that exists between these two bands. So this larger, more anterior band is responsible for this direction. And the smaller, posterior band beats in opposition. And the food is captured between these two. As it turns out, this larger band is also used for locomotion. So our animal moves up. The direction of beating is down, the animal is swimming upwards. And the, the two ciliated bands work together to tr capture particles. It's kind of a neat system. And, it, and, it, and that's actually, that system is perfect. Works just the way it's described. Here's an example of something. I don't know who it is, and it's, I really don't know. But what you can see is there's a, there's a band of these cilia that beat. And they're beating towards the bottom, towards the floor here. And if you look, if I can find a little red dot, there it is. There is another band of cilia that's below it. And that's the one that's beating right in the opposite direction. And there's the mouth, and there's the esophagus. So the idea is that particles are trapped between those two, trafficked to the esophagus, and down it goes. Right? So particles, and this is the, the big thing about 
feeding by little animals that they have to concentrate particles. Right? They, this, these two bands that are meeting in opposition to one are actually taking particles that are separated from one another and concentrating them into a smaller space before they're ingested. So this, it's not just a willy-nilly thing. The idea is that the particles are captured or concentrated within this food group and then they're ingested, they're eaten. Okay. This is one of my favorite animals. I guess it's my favorite, you know, it's not my favorite invertebrate, but it's close. Um, this is something called Brachionis plicatilis. I, and it's one that we use, my students are using continuously. This is the female. Males are really boring. The females are, are actually pretty neat. Um, parts that are of interest, here's these ciliated bands up here. And you can see them as these little bits of hair, if you will, these extensions here. So these are the structures that are beating, and it propels the animal, in this case, towards the ceiling. Um, these two structures here, just to sort of orient us, are digestive glands. So enzymes are produced in these glands, and they're deposited into this sort of stomach here, where any collected particles are digested. There's an intestine, and there's, uh, there's an anus. What I want you to notice, though, if you don't mind, this is me wandering over here. Remember, we said that the, what was it, the trochus was on top and the cingulum was below. And the trochus beat posteriorly, the anterior one beat down, and the posterior ciliated band beat it upwards. And so we had this sort of convergence. And then the mouth was sort of between the two. If we look at Brachionis, we got a problem. It's missing this lower band. It's actually not missing the lower band. It's just that this is the lower band. And so a larger band of cilia, the band that's responsible for swimming, is the lower band in this animal, where in the first one, it was the anterior band that was the most, was the largest of the two. So my animal, Brachionis, has one band here and another band here. But this one doesn't really beat. And this one does, and it beats in a posterior direction. So this, this model, the model of how rotifers feed, where two bands are working in opposition to one another, it doesn't work. My animals didn't read the book apparently. And so, but they didn't give up. They found a different way, perhaps, to concentrate particles. And although, and we really don't know how they do it, to be fair. To be honest, they do eat. But how they collect particles is sort of mysterious. It hasn't been well resolved. So this is the animal that's going to be sort of our friend for a while. It's my friend for a long time. And I guess I did this already. I'm stupid. The idea is this is the model for how it's supposed to work. This is the posterior band, which should be the little one. And this is the anterior band, which should be the big one. But they're reversed. My animals aren't built the right way, sadly. They're still happy. OK. And so this is where, I, this is where my mind gets strange. And I'm sorry if this is, I'm allowing you to see the way my mind works. This is me. I'm six feet tall, roughly. At least I was probably then, standing and looking sort of bewildered. OK, so let's just think about, let's try to think like a rotifer for a moment. Got it. All right. So, oops. So I'm, I'm going to say that six feet, I'm, imagine this rotifer is as tall as I am. And so we're, now we're going to ask questions about how big are the particles that I might be able to eat. If I take an algal cell, right, one of those little a unicellular plant cell that's in the oceans, it's going to be about the size of a ping pong ball, so something about like this. If I ingest a bacterial cell, imagine a little sphere that's about a quarter of an inch in diameter. And if I think about something the size of a small virus, I am 1 32nd of an inch. Imagine a little bitty sphere that's about like that. Okay. So now the problem is, how do I concentrate and capture these particles? Okay, one, can I concentrate and capture these particles? And if I do, how the heck does that happen? How does that work? 
So it's, it's challenging to be a little animal in the, in the ocean or in a lake. All of the particles are small, and they're all, there's a great distance between particles, so it's, a, it's hard. So we started asking kind of silly questions, like, can rotifers eat bacteria-sized particles? It seemed reasonable. And so someone named Stephen Little a few years ago sort of did this. And, and what we've shown you here is just saying we had two sized beads. We had a bead that was six microns in diameter and a bead that was much, much smaller. Let's say it's, it was 0.5 microns in diameter. This represents sort of our idea of what an algal cell might be. And this represents our idea of what the size of a bacteria might be. My apologies to the bacteriologists in the, in the room. This is my concept. I may be off, but I'm willing to accept that. Um, what we found is the following. They're really not very good at this, right? So if we look at the variation, so this is just plotting. When the neat thing was, we measured both at the same time. We asked the question, in a mixture of particles, what was the rate at which they captured the big ones? And this week it asked the question, what was the rate at which the same animal captured the little ones at the same time? And it turns out they're much better at capturing big particles. There's a much more variation in terms of their, the amount, the number of particles. And we're just expressing, just view this as the number of particles captured. It's analogous to that. So they, they are cap, they caught into, there's much more variability in terms of the capture of small particles large particles, excuse me, but small, small particles, really no difference. And if we, it's, it was kind of fun because we found that big particles, the presence of big particles influences the capture of little particles, but the presence of little particles has no effect on the capture of big particles. So there was, there was some evidence that capturing big things, our six micron beads, was somehow interfering with the ability of these animals to capture little particles. It was kind of fun. Stephen really hated me because he had to stare in little particles for hours. But I guess the real question is, even if they do, um, does it mean anything? And so if we sort of ask the question, sure, let's assume for the moment that animals, that our rotifers can capture these small particles, does it really mean anything? Is there any, what's the contribution, if you will, to their energetics or their energy metabolism? Turns out, although much as I'd like to say it was great, probably not much. So I can demonstrate, if you will, ingestion. They eat them. They, at least they get in their tummies. But if you sort of make some calculations of what the, the benefit of those processes would be, you end up saying, OK, it's a number greater than 0, but not enormously more. Not, not much more than zero. So here's the problem. So my animals can capture particles that are too small, if you will. Right? The, the mechanisms, the descriptions of how particles are captured by invertebrate animals doesn't, don't really account for the collection or capture of small particles. They still do, um, but we don't really have a sense of how that's happening yet. So. Then we ask the question, well, what about this dissolved organic stuff, my soup idea? And here it's a little bit easier to test, to be fair. Um, so this is, again, Brachyonis plicatilis. And these are the results of a series of experiments that were done by Stephanie Ross. Um, and so what we're, going, what we're going to see is a series of images of animals that have been exposed to a protein, which we're going to call ferritin. So it's going to be ferritin's a protein. We put this protein into, into seawater. It's in solution. And then we're going to use the fact that we can detect the presence of ferritin, or iron, really, as a blue. We can stain for iron, and it turns blue. And so we can use the color. We can use color as a qualitative estimate of how much material is being ingested and assimilated or absorbed by these animals. And so this is an animal that was not exposed to ferritin, to sort of be, to be fair, if you will. Fair with ferritin. OK, so this is an animal that has been exposed to it's like 0 0.1 milligrams of ferritin per mil for three hours. The blue represents here the, the site within the organism where we find 
where ferritin was assimilated or absorbed. So the animals somehow ingested it, got it into their, their digestive system, and once that material was in their digestive system, they were able or capable to absorb it as any other, as it would for any other food particle. So this is 0.5 milligrams per mil. That's the abundance of ferritin for three hours of exposure. Excuse me, 0.1. I'm ahead of myself. 0.5, the same, the same experiment we had in parallel. Individuals that were exposed to five times more concentrated solution of our dissolved organic material, in this case ferritin, and we get a much more intensive stain. Yes, sir, please. It's about 70,000. The molecular weight is around 70,000. Uh, dimensions, physical dimensions? Wow, good question. I'm going to guess. Can I guess? A nanometer? Okay. Very small. Yeah, so, so, I mean, so this really is in the realm of what we consider materials that are in solution, right? So... Yeah, so this is, it's, it's a big molecule, but a small particle, if you will. It's not. So, but in, all, in both cases, or in, all, in every example here, organic material that exists in solution enters the digestive system and is assimilated by the animals. Okay, this is even, this is ap, a, a Splankna priodonta. This isn't, but this is the animal we're going to talk about. Asplankna is beautiful. This is about a millimeter in size in real life. I'm not suggesting this is literally a millimeter in size. But in real life, this animal is about a millimeter. It's a voracious carnivore. It's great. Um, it's just a mean animal. It's the wolf of the pond, if you will. Okay, so I had a student a few years ago, Stephanie Ross, who did this really neat thing with a splankna. So this is an animal, I mean, so step, let me step back for a moment. Brachionis feeds on tiny particles. We think of it as something that collects little particles. A splankna, I mean, literally, it's a, it's a predator. I mean, it, it looks friendly, but it's not, right? It's, it's a predatory animal. And so what she did, what Stephanie Ross did here, we exposed this animal, these animals, to, in this case, it's a, what we call a polysaccharide, poly, polysaccharide, right? called dextran, and to which, we, to which a fluorescent molecule has been linked. So we've got a big sugar, which we're going to call dextran, and we're going to be able to visualize its distribution in animals based on the fluorescence, right? We're going to use the light that's emitted from the animal, the, from the molecule, to identify where it is. So we did dextran is our polysaccharide, and we're going to use what we call bovine serum albumin. Serum albumin from cows, um, which has also been labeled by a fluorescent molecule. So we can look and see where that material has been deposited. And so both the dextran, one molecule, and this protein, BSA, in one hour, this concentration, again, the materials enter the digestive system and are absorbed or, if you will, assimilated by the cells. Just to give us a, a little bit of a splank in the biology, this is pretty harrowing. This is the offspring of a splankna. So this is mom, and this is her offspring. And that offspring is going to actually emerge from mom and mom will survive, which is pretty astounding. That's a pretty big kid. OK, so this is in six hours. And there's a couple of things to note. So these are different animals, but they've been exposed for six hours. Um, the distribution of the label is the same. But if I look here, right? so this is dextran. And this is my BSA treatment. And this, this little shadow here represents the little kid? Represents, represents the little kid? Actually, I'm sorry, it is the same person. Forgive me, this is the same animals. Bad will. This little shadow represents the, the offspring that we see here. And the label, right, this fluorescent label that we've tagged, what was initially attached to the protein, is no longer restricted to the cells that are of the digestive system. 
it's now present throughout the body cavity of the whole animal. Okay. So this protein, which we're going to call, it is DSA or bovine serum albumin, is absorbed and then it's digested by the cells and it's di then it becomes, dis the label becomes free to be distributed throughout the whole body cavity of the animal. It doesn't happen in the case of dextran because dextrans aren't digested by our cells. So this just shows where it was taken up, where the material was absorbed. This shows that it, and sites of absorption are the same, but what we see with this protein is that it's, it enters metabolism and there's evidence of digestion and then distribution within the body of the animal. So a dissolved, material, a dissolved organic material, two kinds, polysaccharide, a sugar, and a protein are absorbed or by the digestive system, and at least we have evidence the protein, the proteins that are enter the digestive system are then metabolized or enter metabolism. Okay, how am I doing? I'm doing good. If rotifers do ingest dissolved organic materials, then again, does it mean anything? Is it like Maria von Trapp and the kids? Um, and it turns out it's better than bacteria. So our estimates, are, my estimates for what it's worth, suggest that it's about 15% of the metabolism, right? So the energetic cost of the animal could be contributed through the assimilation or the uptake and absorption of dissolved organic materials. Kind of neat. I kind of like it. Doesn't explain everything, but that's okay. I'm okay with, with dissolved organic materials representing a piece of the pie and bacteria representing a smaller piece of the pie. I think we might be getting a better idea of what an animal is actually capable of eating or does eat. All right. Other possible sources of food. Uh, I hope I've shown you evidence that phytoplankton, these plant cells, can be captured, at least in the form of bees. Um, there's at least evidence, we offer evidence that bacteria-sized particles, again, not really bacteria, but the beads the size of bacteria are taken or captured somehow. If we go to the other side, to the dissolved world, we have these macromolecules, a large carbohydrate, we call it dextran, and we have this protein, we're gonna, we call it either ferritin or, or bovine serum albumin. I will tell you, without showing you any evidence, perfect. That if you if you use um, if you use if you um, measure the rates at which these animals can transport uh, amino acids, the individual molecules that make up a protein, they can do that too. That's not shocking because every cell can. And nevertheless, they can take they can my little rotifers can exploit truly small dissolved organic materials. So then the next question is, what's left for us to look at to see what they're capable of exploiting? And so now it comes to what we're doing now. And this is fun. Okay, so this is a, this is a, di this is a picture I stole. Um, at least I'm, I, that's where I stole it from. Um, which shows, the dis so this is a sample of seawater and then the, all the big things have been removed, and then they applied a stain, and that stain labeled the nucleic acids, DNA, found in these big things, which are bacteria, so think 0.001 to 2 millimeters, and the little small dots represent viruses, okay? So as it turns out, there's a lot of virus out there. So when we think about, so think about bacteria existing at concentrations of a million cells per mil, milliliter. When we think about viruses, we think about 10 million viral particles per, per milliliter in seawater. So lots of particles, really, only until recently, kind of too, no one, actually no one cared, let's be fair. No one cared. It's actually it's true. 
They sort of care now, and we'll talk about that in a bit, I guess. Okay, and then, this is even crazier, it turns out that in the ocean there are plant cells that, this is something called prochlorococcus, a small, a small plant cell, and what it does is it releases small little vesicles, if you will. It releases even smaller spheres, and within those small spheres are carbon, right? So it releases as these little vesicles, and you can see one with the little red, with the red arrow there, it's continually releasing these vesicles. And then I, I checked, this is not a typo, okay? So this is a very abundant plant cell. It's thought to have released a billion, billion, billion of these things a day in the ocean, okay? So it's, I mean, it's a big number, but the ocean's big, and these guys are small. But nevertheless, there's lots of little, there's, this is another so, uh, source, if you will, of very small particles, again, viral size, 20 nanometers per, per 20, 10 to 20 nanometers in size, that could be exploited by an animal which captures food in, an, in a different way. And so, I have two people who are sort of involved in this now. One is named, one woman is, or one person is Samantha Sorensen. And so her, her sort of charge was to ask the question, do rotifers capture viruses? And so Dave Bolliver, who's the chair of the biology department, he's the guy I go to for viruses. He's always got a stash someplace. Um, gave us some uh, virus that, bacteriophages, right? Bacteriophages are viruses that use bacteria as hosts. So Dave gave us some, some bacteriophages, and then Samantha labeled the coat, the capsid coat of the bacteriophage, with a molecule whose name is too long, but I can say DTAF. Um, and then we said, well, let's take some of these labeled bacteria, let's put them, expose our rotifers to these labeled bacteria, and ask really the pretty simple-minded question, which is about as good as it gets for me, what happens? And so, this is a rotifer. This is Brachionis. It's not happy because it's dead, unfortunately. But what you see here is the appearance of this DTAF label within the digestive system and within the cells of these animals. Okay. So, Rotifers, Brachionis plicatilis, this rotifer, when exposed to labeled bacteriophages, is capable of ingesting them. And this one, this picture, I just, I was afraid the room wouldn't be dark, would be, something would be wrong with the room. This is the same image, I'm not trying to make it better. But the idea is, is that the label, this is the same picture, I've just sort of brightened this one. The idea is that the label is uniquely associated with the digestive system. And so, if you say, well, what about, did the animal fluoresce without the virus? Nope, you wouldn't see it at all, it's black. So, no, in the absence of these labeled bacteriophages, we see no color. And then you might say, well, what about just adding the label? What if you had, what if you somehow remove the bacteriophages and just add the label at the same concentration? Would you see the same result? And we don't. And then it gets even better. And so then we then we thought, well, we need a better con we need a better positive control. So then we took the concentration of the label that we used to label the bacteria bacteriophages. That makes sense. So we exposed the bacteriophages to this label, and then we removed the un the free label, and we just have the bacteriophages that are have this stain attached to them. Well, we asked. We just put our rotifers in with the label itself at that higher concentration, and then the whole animal glows. So what these, this image suggests to us is that the one suggests two things. One, the label is not free in our experimental container, and so because it's restricted to the digestive system, and if we just expose the animal itself to the, the free label, the whole animal begins to glow. 
Here, it's restricted to only those regions of the digestive system that are, right, continu well, it's continuous with the mouth through the digestive system. This, these materials had to enter the digestive system. They had to be, they had to feed. They had to collect those stained bacteriophages. That was pretty neat. And I thought, that's great. And then I thought, but, again, I thought of the sound of music, and I thought, wonderful, we can demonstrate something, but it's meaningless. Um, and then I asked, we, I, I asked Stephanie Patton to try to do something that shouldn't work. And I, we said, can, if we provide our rotifers with nothing, right? So we got, I've got seawater, and I've done our best to have nothing inside. And I compare that to what happens to the rotifers that are exposed only to these bacteriophages. So I've got nothing, if you will, a control. I've got plus bacteriophages. And then we're going to compare it to animals that we're going to feed algal cells to, things we know should work. And we're going to ask questions, can we see a difference among the animals that are treated in different ways? Is that OK? It's like three treatments, nothing. Really, it's, we're just going to watch them starve. I'm sad, but it's kind of what's going on. Bacteriophages, that's the only source that we're adding. And then the other is um, we're adding algal cells, things that we know they eat. OK. So this looks at survivorship. Right? So again, this is a death curve. Um, what it is, right? We're sort of asking the question. The blue ones represent the animals that are fed the algal cells. And so we start with everybody being alive, and we end up with basically most everybody being alive. That this represents the best of all possible worlds. The control is we're starving. And that's the worst of all possible worlds. And oh my god, my bacteriophages are behaving as some, it suggests to us that it's something in between, well it is, it's in between these two extremes. That Well, our it's excellent. And so you're correct in that I cannot guarantee. It's as particle free as I can achieve. And so I've got the, the water, the seawater that we used is passed through a filter that is 0 0.2 micrometers, has pore sizes of 0 0.2 microns. I'm sorry, please? Well, there's always, it's a really good question, and my hesitation is, Well, the, the filter, right, should, be, should exclude the size. By size alone, the filter should exclude bacteria. The comparison among the, th even, if, even if we allow for the fact that there's perhaps things in there that we don't know, if you will, right? So I, maybe there's a few really small particles or small organisms that we're unaware of. That water is the source of all three treatments, so whatever the... Um, initial state is is equally distributed among all. That's my best explanation because at some point, is anything ever? How do I you really know that anything is ultimately particle free? In a sense, we've done the best we've done the best that I can achieve here. There's chemical treatment is actually is complicated because my animals are alive, um, and I want to maintain that. I don't want to contribute to anything that's going to make in, be injurious to them. Uh, the, you, we can sterilize the water. I mean, so the water is sterile to begin with, but there's always the chance that something's been added. But whatever has been added is equally distributed among the three treatments. That's my best explanation for you about that. Whatever, if there is a contaminant, it should be equally distributed. But it's a really, because I'm having trouble sleeping at night, to be fair. This, this, is, this is bewildering to me. So, but it suggests that the presence of bacteriophages 
and I guess that's really what it suggests. The presence of bacteriophages somehow is allowing my animals to survive better than they would in their absence of bacteriophages. And it's still the best of all worlds, though, are those things that you know, we know they feed on and successfully reproduce. We look, whoops, Stephanie also looked at the number of offspring released. I said earlier that rotifers are kind of nice because they don't need a friend, right? They can just have, make babies just by thinking about it. And so, but here we see a really big difference. So again, this is the number of, the average number of offsprings released per female during this 150 hour experiment. And so somebody's, somebody's, the average number of offspring as a function of time, right, the number of offspring is decreasing. There's a reason for that, and I'll happy to share that with you later if you'd like. But the idea is that if you give them the best food, we get more offspring. We give them phages, and we do not nearly as well. And phages, in, with respect to promoting or offspring or reproduction are not nearly as effective as these algal cells. But in terms of survivorship, there is evidence that the presence of these bacteriophages is somehow providing something, and I'm gonna make, I'm gonna leap out and say some, there's some energetic contribution that's coming from phages. We're, so, I saw this and then said, okay, what went wrong? Because this shouldn't happen. We did it again and whatever we're doing incorrectly is still happening. Um, and so we're gonna to continue to do it until Stephanie graduates, which, um, which if I had my druthers, won't be until next year, next academic year. Um, but the idea is, it, well, okay. The idea is, it's, you know, when, when you make, this is the problem about being smart sometimes, you, you make a decision about what should happen, and then you make some calculation, and you say, oh, look, 5% means nothing. Oh, 15%, oh, that could mean something, but I don't know what it is. And then, ideally, when you ask an animal what's going on, they might tell you something different than you would have normally achieved. I'm good, don't worry. I'm cooking with gas. Okay, um, so are these processes unique to rotifers? That question alone suggests to you that, of course, it's not. Um, it turns out that everything swallows seawater. Every animal that's ever been evaluated, and this shows uh, something, this is a coral, the developmental stage of a coral that's been exposed to that poly, well, it's been so exposed to an iron-containing molecule, so that's the blue stuff. Here's a, an anemone, a sea anemone that's been exposed to a label in solution. This is actually a, a cladocerin, um, a crustacean that we find in lakes locally. And the blue tube there is its digestive system. And the reason it's blue is because it swallowed stuff that was in solution. And this is the same kind of animal exposed to different concentrations of, again, a protein which has been labeled with a fluorescent stain. Initially, it's restricted to the digestive system. But eventually, that label becomes distributed throughout the entire body of the animal, indicating that it's been metabolized, right? Those molecules are entering the digestive system and they're being metabolized. They're being used as food. Okay, so this is all about utensils. There's only one utensil of value with respect to most invertebrate animals. That's important, at least to me. It's obvious. It's a straw. Because all of these animals, the way they're capturing particles that are too small, right? Viruses, macromolecules, Bacteria-sized cells, dissolved materials, the only way those materials are entering the digestive system is they're being, these animals drink. They pass water through their digestive system, and any organic material that's contained within that flow can contribute to their energy metabolism. Right? It's, a, it's a source of organic material. It's a source of food that largely we've ignored because we're not very smart. But animals are pretty clever. They can take advantage of sources of food that maybe, if you say, what's the contribution of one little kind of food? It may be small. But the ocean contains lots of different kinds of molecules, many, many different forms of small particles, 
All of them can contribute to the energetics of the animal. So this is sort of what we do every day, um, is ask questions about how animals drink and what animals do with the things that, that they do drink. And um, it's a source of immense fun. Um, and that's sort of the way we do things. So that's my, that's my talk or my, my little lecture today about animals and how they feed. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. I don't know what's next, I'm afraid. Oh, good, nothing. Um, so what, can I, what, what, what bewilderments have I created? What can I do to help? Yes, sir. Oh, that's OK. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Oh, it's really important. Yeah, there's lots of little. Oh, my pleasure, sir. My pleasure, sir. So good. Um, it's so um, yeah. See, didn't that didn't that sound great? Um, uh, where's my where's that idiot pen? Oh, <gasps> ignore it. Okay, so here's the, here's the, so if the idea is add so add something that's dissolved and then plus something that's not. Well, the, the, the bacteria and the bacteria base. Oh. And then measuring the difference. Oh, you know, we're trying to find, so everything I've described for you is very qualitative. Look, it's green. It's more green. It's blue. It's more blue. And so and from that, we're inferring more of something. And so we, we need to get to the point where we can quantify things more carefully. And so what we're, what actually a student named Zach Zimmer is trying to do is to sort of, sort of we're trying to create a, a little software program that's going to allow us to quantify the fluorescence that's being emitted, and then from that we can perhaps make more informed estimates about rates. Um, at the moment, you know, when we when we talk about rates of delivery of materials through the digestive system, we're really using small beads as a way to infer the actual amount of fluid that's flowing, which is the best we can do at the moment, though not entirely satisfactory. It would be great to have two label two thing two items labeled differently that we can discriminate and then measure simultaneously, that would be cool. Um, I'm just so, con oh, my, this is the, what I think this is the I think I know moment. Um, I think animals just drink all the time. And there's two ends through which things can drink, right? Fluid can, end, can actually end, enter either end. And any materials contained within that flow is available for consumption. Uh, but no, that would be wonderful to do. Yes, ma'am. Do the rotifers, everything they're taking in, it all goes in? I'm thinking about I have a, a water turtle. Whenever it eats, it has to be underwater to eat. So it takes in the water, but it spurts it out its nose. Because oh, yeah. it's not going to swallow that. No, do rotifers do that also? Well, so here's the, it, that's, that's a really good, so, you know, the model, so the, the way, um, the way we're the way we're taught about how animals collect particles is get rid of the water. Water's bad because that's just diluting things. And 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 I think from the perspective of thinking about capturing particles, that's a really it is a bad strategy just to drink as a way to capture particles. You need animals need to have some step. That is gonna blind you. Animals need to have some step where they take particles that are dilute and concentrate them into a, a, if you will, a bolus or a ball, and then they swallow that ball so they're not getting all that excess water. Now, which means something's weird here because these animals, in the absence of particles, or the presence of particles, quite frankly, they drink water. So these, whether or not there's a particle present, that water is flowing through. And then why is that happening? It's drink, and then, then you start getting a headache because yeah, well you do get headaches. What I think is happening is, so we talk about a tube, but that tube has, has um, sphincters, right? It has valves. And so what we don't know is whether that thing, those valves are always open, and so it's always, 
it's always a, literally a continual flow of, or, or of batches of fluid coming in. We seal the valves. We digest and assimilate or absorb the materials. We open and flush it. If it's done as batches, so if, it's pro if the water is processed as batches, or the water is just continuously flowing. We don't have the temporal resolution to, to know that. But drinking, you know, if, if you think about rates at which you can't explain the capture of particles by drinking because you sort of end up calculating velocities of particles that are like bullets going through, and it just doesn't work that way. There has to be this concentration step. But this weird sort of end run about drinking and having the ability to exploit the things that are consumed, I think is interesting. I find it in amusing. Yes? Yeah, that was so neat. Those babies are like, they're covered by... No, they don't. Nothing goes in those crazy things. They are, which is weird. So the thing, the little babies develop inside mom. And the, the crazy thing about these animals, well, there's a number of crazy things about these animals. So mom somehow gives things, so little critter, little gizmo, is getting things from mom. At least within the time spans of our experiments, little gizmo is pretty isolated. And I don't understand that. Um, among, that's just one of the many things I don't understand. But we've never been able to demonstrate that. It doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. It just means that whatever we're using to see it isn't revealing it to us. Um, I mean, I don't think we can say just because we didn't see it means it didn't happen. But it's a good question because um, actually rotifers are really neat. They're born with this, you know, once, a rotif once the rotifer is formed, that's the total number of cells it has its entire lifetime. So they may get bigger, but it's just because the cells get bigger. They never have, they have a fixed number of cells for that entire lifespan. So every female is going to produce so many eggs because that's the number of eggs. Those are the number of cells she started with that are going to become eggs. So, I don't know, I just said that because it's interesting. Um, it's just fun. That's what makes Rotifers so neat. It has nothing really to do with anything, but it's just, you know. Yes? So do, do you, so you're talking about that virus food. Rotifers, could they ingest pathogenic virus? See, that's the only thing that people like about viruses and invertebrates. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. They make Ebola. No, no, no. <laughs> Actually, no, it's, um, so uh, to be fair, we've known for a while, we being they, have known for a while that um, um, single cell sort of protozoans, pro single c unicellular animal cells have the ability to, to concentrate and capture bacteriophages or viruses. Um, that's been known for a while. But uh, there was something if, a couple of years ago where the thought was, could we use organisms like clams, which pass a lot of water across a filtering sort of epithelium as a way to reduce cholera bacteria. And so to use them as a way to sort of, is that right, bacteria, cholera? That's good? Yeah, okay. good memories. Okay. Um, and so there was, there's, there's at least a couple of sort of, I mean, I don't think it's very practical, but it's kind of a neat study. Um, so that's been looked at a little bit, but not from, well, actually, well, but not from this perspective. So as far as I know, we're the only twisted people who've done this. Um, though we're not the only twisted people, we're just the only twisted people who've done it, um, who've done this study. And the next step is, of course, to ask this, the even perhaps sillier question, do rotifers control bacteriophages in some way? So can we, does the presence of rotifers, at least in a little experimental container, remove enough bacteriophage to really have some regulatory control over that population of, of phages. But I have to wait for Dave to get back from sabbatical for that. Yes, sir? Well, uh, in the summertime, in the Caribbean Sea, oh, yes. then sometimes the algae turns toxic. <laughs> and then the barracudas, which I fish for, they will eat that algae Yeah, so those are dinoflagellates. 
you remember? Anybody remember whose they are? I don't remember. It's Ciguatera disease. Ciguatera, I think, is the condition that if you eat that barracuda or you eat some of those predators, it's not good. It's a neurotoxin for us. Uh, in fact, what the fishermen do when they land a barracuda, and if it doesn't move, like, uh -huh. you know, uh, like it should. And you give it to their sister, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, oh, no, okay. I'm, you're, I'm going into a land where I'm not comfortable. Um, so the barracuda probably aren't consuming the algae directly. I think they're probably consuming other fish that have consumed the dinoflagellates. I think they're dinoflagellates, the algal cells. Um, so I don't think there's a direct consumption on the part of the barracuda. I'm going to back away and say, I don't know. <laughs> but it's a really good question. And I, perhaps I should know it, but I don't. I don't know. Yeah. Well, evidently, uh, the cats, they, they either get sick or they can't get sick. Yeah, well, there's the... It, 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 depends, it depends on the fish. Well, I hope it depends on the fish and not on the cat, right? You wouldn't want to have, <laughs> have a bunch of cats out there, some of them that are never affected. They wouldn't be good models for that program. Cheers. Have a good day.